here. Their content. There it goes. So, does it look right now? Looks good. Back to the waterfall. Okay, so I have th uh, three videos to go through, and then we can generate some discussion and, and chat comments. Uh, the the first is actually a set of troubleshooting videos. I think I actually made this for a, a meeting in Australia last summer, and then I uh, we ran out of time, and I never got to show it. Um, so I think you'll be the first to see it. Some of them are clips from things we've done at the Norris meeting in Las Vegas. And then um, two videos, uh, one on single port and one on Retsia sparing, just to show you some new wrinkles in uh, robotic prostatectomy. So uh, this one will go through a lot of the classic um, troubleshooting things. Uh, that's a shot from Norway last summer. Remember back when we were allowed to travel? <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the, the common things we deal with is TERPs. Uh, and uh, of course, doing a TERP retsius, uh, I don't have video on that just yet. I've done a, a, some limited ones, but as you can see for cases like this, that's gonna be a pretty chaotic thing to do, um, depending on what the original surgeon did. So if they've really done extensive bladder neck uh, resection, uh, then you end up with this large cavity that you often drop into fairly quickly when you do the anterior wall. And then the, the challenge here is to then just establish where the lateral bladder wall is and where the true correct cutoff should be. So you can see down where the sucker is at six o'clock in here. This is pretty much normal bladder making the turn here, trigon will be out of the way. And then um, you just kind of work your way around the sides, uh, taking down the parts that were not had nothing to do with the terp so that you can then get a clean shot. You can almost see the uh, scar line here between the two. If someone's really resected close to the trigon for some reason, hypothetically, you might be closer than you're comfortable with. We'll have later in the video uh, some example of putting uh, stents in, um, you know, if you had a complicated reconstruction like that. Uh, so this part of the case, you're kind of beyond the terp that's just doing some of the lateral uh, uh, pedicles there. And this is a case clearly where I did a posterior uh, dissection. Uh, this is now skipping to post um, reconstruction, so the prostate's out. And this particular video, I'm showing anterior reconstruction, although I must admit, over the last year or so, I've sort of preferred more of the lateral uh, reconstruction, uh, doing kind of the uh, fish mouth from the side. I think that puts the ureters out of the way as well. And I guess this was a case where I did a little bit of both. I'll, I'll let you be the judge of whether or not I've sped up the video or I'm, I'm really working this fast, right? <laughs> That's a 2.0 bike roll on a UR6. Uh, you see the progress reaching around the side. Uh, I see some people go right to the anastomosis and then it's trying to figure it out later, which you can do, but then you're often doing that work uh, farther away. So I tend to pull it up in my face and reconstruct it. So you can see some of the uh, principles. There's, you're often gonna drop into the uh, bladder very quickly, uh, anteriorly, find the trigone, carve lateral to medial, uh, again, showing a hybrid reconstruction, fish mouth plus anterior, and then just be careful if the terp was well out of bounds. I think most surgeons are well-trained enough not to get lost in the apex. The only time I've seen that terribly violated was when uh, someone actually had uh, really tumor invading the transition zone and there was sort of a T3 tumor. And when I went through their apex later in the case, you could tell that they had they had uh, resected some of the muscles. So patient did well, but ultimately needed a sphincter uh, on that case. This guy did fine. So we'll let the video play on. Um, So this is just another thing that, you know, I think a lot of times uh, trainees um, are a little bit, they're trying to replicate exactly what we're showing them and they're not always like improvising, which is what we'll do situationally. So on a transperineal case, sometimes due to obesity, or other factors, the bowel's really in the way. So that was an example of just putting in a 2R, UR6 and then using your Carter Thompson 
to exteriorize it up near the camera. So you basically can do a marionette string pull on the on the Eurekis. I'll play it again just real quick because it is so short. So here's the cut Eurekis. That's a way to pull that on tension. Um, of course, with Dr. Joseph's extra peritoneal, you, you wouldn't have that problem. But if you like a lot of space, that's one way to do it. Occasionally, I've done that transperitoneally on cardiac risk patients where we didn't want to put them in steep trendelomer. You can create it with this string here. Then the progress just reaches over. So um, other things people have done are clipping the bowel or the epiplocate or the peritoneum. I've seen the assistants, of course, having them use both hands to retract, address the uh, Trindelenburg, sometimes having to burp instruments up and down um, to have good access. Now, another great indication for Retsia sparing, now that I've learned it, is an IPP in place, because then you can just avoid the entire thing. And I think we've, oddly enough, had a string of about three patients with IPPs uh, where they had nice small glands, so we did the whole thing posteriorly and stayed out of this. But if you haven't learned that, or maybe it's not a good candidate for Retsia sparing, uh, occasionally you will run into IPPs in the way. So the two main principles are don't get into the pseudo capsule. Uh, and but once you get oriented um, to it, then you basically inflate the prosthesis on the table, which nursing staff usually thinks looks kind of interesting. Because um, once you inflate the prosthesis, then the reservoir will deflate, and you can um, uh, get this out of the way and generally have good exposure. The thing I've found, I've probably done 10 of these over the long career here, and um, they're never, the reservoir is never in the same place. Uh, sometimes it's in the way of your left arm, your right arm, uh, but usually you can figure a way to deflate it and get it out of the way. But again, lately, uh, going posterior, if the rest of the case is appropriate, is a great way to do that. Uh, Badar, actually, I think this is your video. Do <laughs> you remember this one? I don't know if Badar's muted. He's uh, he may have muted all the participants, but uh, uh, this is one that Badar posted in in groups. So uh, you have a cavity uh, violation here, and I've had versions of this over the years too. Um, and it's typically right when you're doing the seminal vesicles, and sometimes when you hit a cavity like that, there's sort of an instant uh, panic uh, until you look further and realize that you're just in a very long-reaching pouch of Douglas. Um, Vip Patel has an unusually cruel version of that video where there happened to be a, a sort of an abscess cavity down there. So he hit the same pouch of Douglas from anterior, and then you see pus go everywhere, and everyone in the room thinks it's a rectal injury until you clean it up and realize that it's not. And obviously, if you start posteriorly, you'll have that figured out and not worry about it. But anteriorly, if you did pure anterior, uh, actually, sometimes even if you've done a posterior dissection, you can kind of run into that plane if it really goes downhill like that. So, a good example of uh, crowdsourcing with Twitter uh, when we see interesting things. Uh, this is a real case. This one was from another Norris faculty. It's an older one, so the resolution's not great. Um, it's a locally advanced case, so they're doing a wide resection. Um, and I'll just be quiet for a second and let you watch. They're coming around the right pedicle, trying to stay a little bit wide. And there you have it. First time I've ever seen a rectal injury from the suction device. So. Uh, exposure on the rectum uh, does not have unlimited uh, uh, tension strength there. And um, so obviously they had to do, uh, you know, a repair. Um, not as many rectal injuries with robotic surgery just from the instrument itself. That's kind of a rare exception there. The only time I've had one recently was actually an unusual case of uh, low anterior resection history with radiation. And the uh, surgery was done back in the 80s. And I think in most cases, the surgeons stay below Denonvier's fascia, and you can find a discrete plane. But this surgeon clearly went above Denonvier's fascia. So everything healed on, on the roof of the, uh, uh, the section line. So as soon as you picked up on the vas deferens, you were in the rectal cavity. Um, so we had to divert that patient. This on a clean primary repair, I think if there's no history of radiation and a good repair, you can 
you can do undiverted, although I'm sure you'll get different opinions from as many colorectal surgeons that you ask. So keep an eye, uh, keep an eye on your uh, assistant and be sure not putting too much pressure. Um, uh, this is kind of a joke here. I actually did the prostate resection, then stepped out of the room for a minute, and the um, fellow jumped on console and started doing the reconstruction. And um, if you're really paying attention, you can figure out what, what he's done already. Uh, then eventually I got back in. You'll see the sucker wake up and uh, check things out. You see it a little bit there. All right, now the suction's awake, and I'm trying to figure out where he's doing. And, and we do have uh, you know, increasing number of women uh, fellows now, so when I say him, I'm being generic. Obviously, I don't want to give anything away. So anyway, if you look carefully what happened, um, uh, the fellows missed the urethra like four times in a row here <laughs> uh, and really just hit the rhabdo sphincter. You can see the mucosa edge there. And it's an important point that I try to emphasize teaching the anastomosis is that your first throw at the urethra is often the most important one because if you hit the mucosa, you can draw the urethra back into the field and you'll increasingly hit it. So that one was far enough along that it had so many misses that, um, you know, we went and chased it. I, as you can see, I cut that uh, anastomosis out and started over and then got the urethra back down. Sometimes they really do run uphill on you uh, and you have to be careful to find it. Then, of course, the other variant of dissection um, is uh, well, certainly you can get into the prostate if you're in a wrong plane, but uh, if you're come back, uh, you can get uh, a, a buttonhole injury. So here's just some excerpts. And I, occasionally this even sneaks up onto me depending on complexity of the bladder anatomy. So, so far everything's set up uh, well. And um, at this point, I can't remember if this is me or trainee doing it, but it uh, doesn't matter. I'm on one, one side or the other. So, um, Good idea to uh, always look back in the bladder periodically and be sure there's not a lip of bladder tissue kind of jutting forward. That's kind of the risk feature. The second risk feature is what you do with your, your third arm, so to speak. If you really reach in there and grab too much tissue, you might pull bladder up into your dissection line and you might be fooled into uh, the correct plane versus the posterior bladder wall. Uh, to me, the biggest risk feature for this as well is that posterior anatomy that juts forward. Um, and so as a result, most of that's kind of dependent bladder. It's very rare. I, I really have never seen a posterior injury that um, actually put the trigone at risk. I mean, unless you were just really, really, really lost. If they just have sort of anatomic variation or you made a little error like you, you'll see going right there, um, it's you'll, you can you can pull the bladder over and, and repair this easily. So here I really let that got confused, lift up and cut straight into the bladder there. You can see how far forward the, the bladder is going that you, you thought it was a full centimeter back. You can actually see that trigonal ridge there. Ureters up here and the injury is well below that, so to speak. So I've, I found that over the years that injury just sneaks up on a variety of surgeons. Uh, when they run into this anatomy, unless you really uh, be, be sure you're in the right plane. So you can see you're right near the longitudinal muscle right in here. So it, you can easily let your guard down. Now I've heard of uh, differences of opinions about what to do here. I tend to just not worry about it and finish the prostatectomy and um, fix it at this step at the end. Other people have said that they'd rather just fix it right away, but um, you can, once the prostate's out of the way, you can very easily roll the, the lip back and and put a few vicral stitches into this hole very easily. And at this point, I've, I've fixed enough of them over the years that um, I don't alter anything post-op. They just still get their catheter out when you normally would have done it. I guess because I'm open trained, I still like to evert uh, mucosa, as you've seen in a couple of clips. It also gives you a nice anchor to hold when you're doing anterior. So now the 
Prograsp is reaching around the corner to hold the longitudinal muscle. There's the um, trigone, and there's the injury, and you can usually close that in one or two, um, one or two bites. One tip I would say is to just put two strings in and then tie them together so that you can see the hole nicely each time you pass the uh, needle. Hey John, this is Badar. The video is getting choppy at times. I wonder if there's any changes uh, in the setting that can be made, or maybe just the bandwidth, I guess. This one's a little bit old. We'll see. Let me see if one of the newer videos is any different. You said, is it like uh, dropping frames, or is it just? Uh... Just the, uh, has a, you know, a little choppy. This, like, um... Okay. Yeah, we've intermittently had that problem, even with Zoom. Um... The, unless we, uh, well, I think I, I'd sent them on Google Drive. Uh, you could play them on your end, although I can't imagine it'll be any different. Still a share screen. Um, let's see how about this one. This one's pretty old too, but it's uh, it's still an important lesson. I, I actually had a because of locally advanced disease had a a, a version of this. Um, Tell me if you maybe you've heard this. Uh, some people will say if you see a big median lobe, um, one of the tricks is to put a stitch in it like this. Um, as the dissection proceeds, I think what you'll find is that this really was, this was sort of a bulge, but not a lobe. So what I'm really doing is pulling the trigone up into the field. And I think I know where everything is. Um, and I think I'm going under a median lobe. But really, if you watch this, that's just a little bit of bulging, and all I've done is pull the trigone closer. So I actually don't do the stitch thing very much anymore. So in this case, as I started to do the anastomosis, uh, started seeing what looked like urine right at the uh, suture line. And this is back when you could still get indigo carmine. So we gave some of that, and sure enough, our posterior line was right on the trigone. You can see it uh, peristalsing there in the distance. So I had this on ten, on purpose a couple of weeks ago, just because of locally advanced disease, despite hormonal therapy. So um, basically, put in a wire. I just like a straight 038 glide wire through the assistant port, and and get a six by 26 stent or something similar, and dunk those in. Now I think, again, currently I would do sort of a fish mouth reconstruction over that, or you can do a posterior tennis racket. This stuff generally re-epithelializes correctly if you if you turn it in correctly. I think one of the NARS meetings, Tom Arling showed an error, again another locally advanced disease that created a similar variant to this. I was always I was trained open. Um, in the 90s, and we were often fighting um, anastomotic leaks posteriorly, and robotically, you kind of learned why that was. Uh, if you have a posterior tennis racket out there, if your stitches are not really close to the line, when you sew it down, they'll kind of spread out a little bit, and you'll have a defect. So if you do do a posterior tennis racket, you got to really control the posterior part of it. So I try to avoid posterior now. This is kind of using the leftover of a V-lock to do uh, a Rocco, take tension down. And then proceed as you normally would. All right, we'll move on past that. I think you can get that. All right. And let's do a, a normal median lobe that was a little more straightforward and just I'll just visually describe what I'm looking for. So I've gone through anterior, um, working lateral, and then here's a, a good size, you know, not huge, but, a, you know, a decent median lobe. And the landmarks you're looking for, you can work underneath, but the key landmark for a median lobe is to get the corner on each side uh, where there's normal um, bladder neck funneling into the prostate. So there's the corner on the left. And I usually try to get to that actually as quickly as possible on each side. Then the median lobe will truly flip up 
and you can follow it down. The, the key is to then, you know, preserve the full detrusor muscle length so you've got good tissue to reconstruct. Uh, and this was one where we knew it from imaging, so it looks like we had done posterior approach as well. I think this is the final segment. Uh, again, I think what people struggle with uh, on their own potentially, or you know, if they're they're still learning their learning curve, is is what to do when the exposure is terrible. So one of the variants we work with, of course, is a really narrow, uh, deep pelvis. And you know, the principles are to really move the ports around, burp the ports around as needed to get them off the bone. You can actually see how. Um, Height is really the, the, look how look at the angle here. As soon as you if you start seeing that the bladder neck is equal to the top of the pubic bone, um, that's going to be a challenging case. You can't always predict that ahead of time, and you'll often be chasing bleeders on the bone because your instruments are just riding on the side of the a wall uh, as you try to get things out, and you may have to burp things in and down further uh, to get them to reach the anastomosis. We'll let this one play out, but uh, does, any questions about um, other troubleshooting um, situations they've been in? Otherwise, I think I'm going to go on to the other two videos that are going to be more recent, uh, you know, pretty pretty looking cases, so to speak, with new techniques. See, my personal preference on apical dissection is not to put clips up there because they can migrate in. So I often have to chase a few bleeders at the end of the case before it's time to start the reconstruction. You can just look up top and see both arms are just riding the bone the whole time. I think XI helps with this scenario because we can set the ports so much higher that we fly in at a lower plane, so to speak. Uh, but on early first and second generation robots, these cases were really problematic. Because if you went too high, you'd run out of port room. And if you're too low, then you're just riding the bone the whole time. All right, I think we got in the message of that one. So let me push uh, to the other next video. Mix it up and do single port and finish with Retsius. All right, is the next video on? It's on the right spring, right? Rickens, it look good still? Yeah, it looks great. Good. All right, so this one's a little newer. So um, we have kind of an unusual fellow this year who was in the military for several years um, and then came back for fellowship. So he's actually done a, quite a few cases himself. So this is kind of the first fellow I've gotten. Uh, into multiple steps on the single port because it's new for us. We started April of last year, and I think I've done about 70 cases. Uh, Rick, and you're still muted, but that's okay. So we'll play this one along. Um, so as the fellow doing the early cases, so this is the extra peritoneal air dock technique. So using the green mini gel port, uh, leaving the uh, the big port within the uh, the bubble you create, so to speak. Uh, and then I use a, a plus one five millimeter assist um, off to the right side, similar to where you would often put a 10, 12 port on, a, on an XI kind of a case. Um, and I, now that I'm more comfortable with the landmarks, I'm actually, in, I did it again today. We had a less experienced fellow with single port today and I just let him kind of run with it. Um, Cause I know this is, uh, this is tough for the trainees because they have to get used to working with this device that has elbows instead of wrists, uh, as well as uh, knowing how to make extra peritoneal exposure. So uh, again, this is a fellow trying to figure out how to move the camera around. Um, but this this setup, you know, it kind of optimizes everything uh, John Joseph taught us many years ago about. Um, you know, the benefits of being in the extra peritoneal space. Uh, we're so low, however. Uh, that, that that initial dissection was just done with a finger. Um, obviously, you could spend the money and 
put the balloon port in there. Um, I'm just trying to average things out. That that gel port we put in there is quite expensive, so I've taken off the uh, balloon dilator and and even on a on a prostate with no nodes, we don't even open an endocatch bag. If the gland's kind of moderate size, you can just reach in with a uh, with a grasper and pull it pull it out at the end of the case. Uh, it took a while to figure out which instrument configuration with single port was ideal. Because if you think about it, single port is a circle. So you've got an instrument um, at 3 o'clock, camera at 12, although you can reverse it. But in camera up position, you've got basic instruments at 3, 6, and 9. And um, so what I found useful is to use the uh, Maryland down at the 6 o'clock position. Uh, it's numbered as the two arm. And then the fenestrated bipolar over at nine o'clock. And the reason for that is that it, it, in many, most cases can rotate around and be an up instrument and give you that 12 o'clock pull. You can see right here, this patient had a history of a hernia repair, you know, as a child. So his peritoneum is inserting down in the inguinal canal. So we got into the peritoneum there much uh, earlier than you normally would. It's no big deal. Uh, we'll just work right around it. Again, theoretically, if you can really limit yourself to just the single port instruments um, and use a drop sucker and no assistant port, then you wouldn't have this issue over here. Although I found that that adds about an hour to the case um, if you really have to stop and suction and retract for yourself the entire case. So putting in a, a simple five um, gives us a, a much quicker case. Pretty much I've got the time similar to XI. This is a five port and it's way off to the side. There's a variant that Applied uses where it's a five port, but it's got a little retention balloon on it. And I found that's that's really nice as well because if that port comes off off screen, it's a bit of a headache to come back there and reset the port. So the balloon's helpful. So this is just me with the suction, helping uh, the fellow move along, defat the, you know, defat the uh, perivesical fat into pelvic fascia. I usually do, I've done all the variations on the uh, dorsal vein uh, based on Jim Porter's trial. If we're gonna come anterior like this, I'd prefer putting in a, uh, a dorsal vein stitch with suspension up to the bone. And again, if you're in a training circumstance, this keeps everything dry, but certainly the cut with selective ligation later is a, is a valid technique some people like. You just have to be good at dissecting the apex with a little more uh, uh, bleeding in the way. A little bit about positioning on single port that occasionally is nice. So the uh, because you're an extra peritoneal like this, uh, I only put them in about 12 degrees or so of Trendelenburg. So they're much flatter uh, with transperitoneal. You're, we're usually at 25 degrees, give or take. And um, then we uh, we have the air seal running, depending on the case, 10 to 12. Usually I don't do the ultra low like Ronnie Abaza talks about. Um, and it, it, we can do a reasonable lymph node dissection uh, if we need to. It's just lengthy to put those instruments over there and do that. If you notice what I'm telling the fellow to do is to is to be very dynamic with the um, with the additional left arm. So if you're going to work on the left side of the bladder neck, have the fenestrated bipolar in the same area, so you get two points of retraction. So move over here. Uh, obviously, for extra peritoneal, you have to do a uh, anterior approach to the seminal vesicles. Um, so it's important to even if you're doing a bladder neck sparing approach, you do need to release. Uh, some of the endopelvic fascia, some of the uh, lateral tissues, so that you've got uh, enough reach to get down to the seminal vesicle. So it's a little different than the, our regular technique again, because you only have one shot at this uh, with 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 a, an assistant instrument. Now today we had an issue again. I was trying to get a trainee through the bladder neck. And I felt like I could either pull the bladder neck apart or I could suction, but I couldn't do both. So again, one of the workarounds for that is to think of uh, re retraction stitches. So all we did is take a 2OUR6, uh, tie it to the anterior bladder wall, and then exteriorize it through the gel port. And then So then you have a string that you can use to pull the bladder apart, and then you can keep your suction in position um, to get in. So 
In this case, we had enough uh, forward momentum. Again, this is a very experienced fellow doing this step, so he's, you can see he's making a lot of good progress and purposeful movements. So we'll pull the Foley back and uh, control that with the, uh, with the fenestrated up until we get through. Also note, uh, if you haven't played with the single port at all or that much, notice there's a little icon here that shows the uh, instruments in space. You can see that the camera's colored green right now, and that's because I've got the camera what's called a cobra position. So you draw the camera up and then you can deflect. It's got a little joint on it. So it can simulate little, it's almost 30 degrees down, not quite 30. Um, and that helps with bladder neck. Whereas at the beginning of the case, the, you'd see the icon was purple, meaning you're, you're in a more of a straight um, angle for the, uh, for the camera. If you were doing, I've done a couple of Retsia spare with the single port, or if you just really wanted to use it under the prostate, you certainly can do a uh, camera down at the six o'clock position. You flip everything around and you can work sort of with your three instruments high instead of uh, on top. I think most of the single port users are being using this as kind of a niche robot, uh, not like full practice. There's a guy, Simone uh, Krilovar, I believe it's pronounced, that's trying to do his whole practice with single port. I, I tend to use it for, you know, reasonable size prostates, and it's ideal if you don't really need to do a, an extended node dissection. Certainly you can, but very time consuming. So again, as I mentioned, uh, so for Trendelenburg purposes, it's less, so that may help. Um, you certainly can do a more complicated bladder neck like a TERP or median lobe. So there might be some cases where it's better to be anterior with this approach versus posterior with the XI doing a, a retsius attempt. Uh, but there, there's clearly going to be some overlap. Uh, if I see kind of a normal gland, but Gleason 8, where I got to do a really good node dissection, lately I've tended to just go XI. Um, Retsia spare, and then you can come across lateral, take peritoneum down over the vessels and do a nice uh, node dissection. Can y'all un un unmute John Joseph at all, so if, if he can comment further? I know, I think your system is up and going. I can't remember where you were. Let me see if I can help. There you go, John. No. It looks like he's not muted. Sorry, I'm in full screen mode because I've been recording, so my interface isn't as great. Oh, sure. Yeah, it doesn't have a mute muting now. No, uh, we're not hearing John. Oh well. Maybe you can type a comment. Yeah, certainly chat is enabled, but uh, maybe it's a microphone issue. Yeah. So uh, now we've switched places. I came on to console, and um, the uh, yeah, the single port is nice for nerve sparing. You've got a very uh, narrowed uh, Maryland tip, and you've got fresh disposable scissors for each case. So if you really like to kind of uh, do sort of a careful clipless <coughs> uh, approach to the nerve sparing, um, I've definitely gotten early functional results, so I think if if you're if you're careful in where you place cautery and you turn it down to one when you're anywhere near the nerve bundle, you can get a good uh, result. You certainly can put clips in with single port, but um, you know if your assistant typically here only has a five access, there is a very nice robotic clip applier, but it's it's like the XI where you have to wait on it. Um, you know, take an instrument out, get it back in, clip, switch back and forth. So if you, you certainly can use it on the on the big ones, but I found that a lot of the stuff you can kind of pick your way through, find a nice plane, and then you know if there's a little excess bleeding at the end, um, sew it up with a, a 4 so, so you can, the other thing, so even though it's nice for fine dissection, it's hard to just power your way through tissue. So I made a, a reasonable um, pedicle there, but that's actually harder to do than XI. 
Also notice on the left uh, with the gel port, one of the tricks is to actually put an additional sucker in. We just call it a drop sucker. There is a commercial company that has a product for that, but this is literally just like an NG tube placed to a, a, a yank hour sucker that costs very little. And that's nice to just have it just sit there and keep the field clean. It does uh, in some many spots allow the assistant to come in with a grasper or just a second um, suction grasp point like he's doing there. Again, like uh, SP as well as XI, you've got all the cautery control on console. So one on monopolar, two on bipolar, whenever you're near those steps. And then when you come back to apex or bladder neck, I'm usually back to two on the uh, on the cautery. All right, and about ready for apex, I believe. We have the catheter put all the way in, then with cautery on two uh, come across. So one other, um, so this is an, one other change I made in the last couple of weeks is to actually take your left arms and switch them back. So now what I've done lately is put the uh, fenestrated down at two o'clock or at, at the number two position, six o'clock. So you can really have it controlling going down. Then you have your Maryland at nine o'clock, so it's kind of up in the air uh, doing the finer dissection points uh, without having to crisscross. The, the instruments just don't like crisscrossing uh, over each other like you can get away with on XI. Get a nice urethral lengthening um, procedures just like you do with XI. And then same same uh, reconstruction. Uh, again, a comment either for extra peritoneal access or some of the patients that have really big gland narrow pelvis. I used to just do a U stitch for the Rocco, but uh, lately, if there's any tension um, risk, then I I'll, I'll put a 3.0 V lock Rocco, Rocco so you can do multiple passes and get the tension down. The um, whenever you do extra peritoneal, you've just got more back pressure on the bladder because more of those structures are intact. And so you typically will have more tension on the anastomosis potentially. Uh, the fellow today kind of had a funny comment because uh, he hadn't used it in a while. He was on my service months ago and then came back and um, for sort of a off coverage case. But he's like, yeah, I felt like a PGY3 all over again. <laughs> um, it's just a different feel to the robot. So a little hemostasis here and then Rocco. And then I, I use a current for several years now. I've used the 3.0 Stratifix with a blunt needle. And here's the 3.0 uh, V-Lock Rocco to, to really park the... Uh, Ladder down in position. You see the prostate just can hang right there. One of the things that can be annoying, uh, you know, on, on transperitoneal, you can bag the prostate and get it way out of the way. Extra peritoneal, it's, it, if you can get it to float, you know, above the bladder, then great, just keep working. If it's really bugging you, again, you can use the gel point for creative uses. So in one case, for example, I, again, put stitches on the uh, specimen and then exteriorize the stitches through the gel point and just pull the prostate out of the way um, so it wouldn't quit uh, falling into your recon reconstructive field. It's a good shot of how the SP is different. Notice how when you're rotating, you're rotating an elbow joint, so it does need a little bit more space down there. Um, and so it just has a different feel to it. And I typically do seven day catheter times without a cystogram if patients are going to stay in my general area. If they're going to leave the area out of state, several hour drive, then um, I usually have them go 10 days because there is an occasional urinary retention. 
We fortunately had a case like this um, where someone had a little bit of either a UTI or retention or enough concern that someone on the outside about two or three weeks post-op put in a Foley and blew up the balloon in the anastomosis and it disrupted half of it. Um, but we were able to, I mean, he was three hours away. We got him back to our center and, and with a wire and a scope, got a catheter back in the bladder and it's, it's healing in. So it, always be cautious when patients return to different areas. Sometimes weird things can happen. Okay, and then the last video is uh, uh, a nice Retsius case. And then let's see what uh, y'all want to talk about. Let me move this over. Video good again? We're okay? Yeah. Yep, video looks good. Perfect. So my Retsius technique is a absolutely bizarre uh, three-year journey of learning parts of it and then kind of getting cold feet and switching back anterior. So I, I didn't really finish Retsius sparing until the fall of last year. Um, and I mean, my initial impressions are that the anterior, if you don't really understand how to do the anterior dissection, you definitely can have positive margin issues in the anterior spaces. I think that can be fixable. Uh, but I, my other impression is that the continence, in my opinion, is stunning. I mean, men in their mid-70s, continent immediately. I've had three or four radiation salvage cases with very early continence. Uh, there's there's something to this, even beyond what Dr. Menon published. Um, so then my main teachers have been Kun Ra from um, uh, Seoul, Korea, and then mostly through videos, but a few meetings uh, I've interacted with Aldo Bacciardi, who, of course, pushed this from Italy up for a long time. Um, and they, those two have their own little tendencies. One of Ra's tendencies is to make the pouch of Douglas incision a little bit higher than you would if you were just doing the uh, seminal vesicles. So that allows you to not have to do a suture, although you certainly can. So like Bacciardi, for example, likes to put an external stitch um, through the through the bladder peritoneum and lift that up and create the exposure. Um, but you know, I spent a while learning parts of this, and um, you can definitely learn parts like this, doing the pedicles from underneath, and doing um, you know getting the denonvies down, getting the SVs down, and then if you want to switch and finish anteriorly, you can. And the idea is you just keep getting better and better at the pedicles until you're really ready to finish a bladder next. So I'll try to comment on that as we get to it. And these are moves you can do posteriorly, even if you're coming from over the bladder. Um, so this is a normal size gland, fairly straightforward. And the key is notice that uh, we're climbing the ladder here. We did a medial pedicle here. Notice how we're moving lateral, but we're also moving up. If you if you go straight out, you'll get across the bundle and lose some nerve tissue. So notice how we're trying to climb the ladder. Uh, we're still at zero degree lens, and you're looking for a space lateral to the pedicles. I mean, you, you do it all the time. You're just used to having lateral um, point of orientation. Take what you can get back here. It's again standard XI approach uh, with you know the, you know two assistant uh, spots, and then the key is to then climb the ladder up here into the anterior spaces. Um, there's a few spots we need to quick uh, switch your exposure around, and it's not a set pattern of working inside out or outside in. It's a little bit of both. Uh, if you're oriented inside out, keep going. But at some point, you need to jump up anteriorly and create a little bit more space to see where to finish. That probably should be enough clipping over there. And then there's the edge up there. I've kind of got a feel for it, so I'm just kind of picking away at this pedicle a little bit at a time, uh, and more of the clip method of doing it. All these are all five hemolocks coming in. And again, bipolar at two, monopolar at one, and chase bleeders as needed.
So the other thing, um, it's not being used right now, but look, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see that the progress was coming from the one arm from the left side laterally, and then the Maryland's the two. Another raw trick is to actually switch those around. So uh, often raw will have the progress coming at two. So that's just coming from the middle of the field and lifting up. And then the, um, the Maryland comes in from the lateral port as your working uh, instrument. I think I intended to do that, but this guy had enough exposure that I just kept working. All right, so this is the important part, turning the, the corner. So you've got to be comfortable lifting up onto trucer fibers here. And um, this is the Bacardi description of you lift up on the bladder and you weaken the tissue with the cautery. And then you lift again, and it's almost like you're separating the detrusor off of the prostate. Don't force planes or you'll cut right into it. So as I cut a little bit now, this showed me a little bit more of the lateral um, anterior pedicle to get down. And then eventually you, you connect the dots over here, you know, at three o'clock to two o'clock range. There's the edge of the bundle coming down. And there's the anterior layers. So, so notice how the sucker is sneaking in there and trying to lift up on the bladder. Um, here, I'm trying to get his instrument in there to do it as well, so I can pull back. And this is where, if you're if you're having trouble with exposure, you can switch to 30 up lens if you want, or you can again do the external suture method to pull up on the bladder. So we are prepared for all that, but we could see, so we just kept going. Switching roles, having the assistant on the prostate so I can lift up and start getting these lateral detrusors. So you kind of think of the bladder neck dissection as equal parts lateral approach, equal parts posterior approach. Think of it as a horseshoe that wraps around uh, the prostatic entry. Uh, you don't want to just blast right through posteriorly or you'll get, you'll get off base. Rather approach a lot of it from the side uh, once you can see the capsule doing a lot of this lifting move, lift up on detrusor, a little bit of cautery to weaken it, and then lift up again. That plane there will take you under the DVC. You can actually follow that all the way to the urethra if you wanted to. And this is just high detrusor stuff where you can work lateral to medial. That side mostly done. At some point, you just need to work on the other side and keep things symmetric. So I, I since you already seen a pedicle, I skipped that for time. So now we've gotten most of the left pedicle done, like you just saw, and now we're trying to do this anterior connect the dots over 10 to 11 o'clock. Even if the continents were equal, the other interesting, intriguing thing about this is how efficient it's been with the surgeons who've stuck with it. So I've probably done, I don't know, 70, 80 of these. Uh, this was a case from last week where the resection time was about 50 minutes, so I was happy with that. Um, but I've seen Rod do in, in complete cases in 15 minutes. So, I mean, his resection time is more like 30, 35, and then a 10-minute reconstruction, and then you're basically closing. Because essentially you're knocking off the time spent on the dorsal vein, on the lateral prostatic fascia, endopelvics. Uh, you don't really have to do a Rocco stitch. Um, so it kind of adds up a little bit. I mean, you really, it's just resection and a single layer anastomosis. So turning the corner there, that's getting the apex released. So one of the orient you can sort of see it there, but one of the orientation things is that the entry point of the bladder into the prostate is very much at a skewed angle in front of you. Um, in fact, when you pass the catheter, you can appreciate how much the the catheter takes almost a right angle turn. So um, this is why you need to approach it as laterally as you can, because what that does is straighten up the junction again, so that then you can hit the catheter straight at posterior. Um, but Charty actually, if he can get by with it, will actually try to pass an instrument in front of the bladder uh, to straighten it up. A rod tends to just uh, get oriented and come through it. So 
So here's longitudinal muscle. Now just looking at it from the other, from the backwards in, and that will try to lift and dissect our way to match up where we had done anteriorly. there you can pull on the catheter uh, like you do um, you know with standard approach it doesn't really move things around a whole lot actually what, I, what you may see me do that's more useful is to just squeeze the bladder neck almost like you're trying to trap or pinch the catheter that actually orients you better than moving it around really so I think that'll show up here in a sec That's the importance of getting your insistent to lock in there and uh, have a good bite so you can um, uh, dissect. So again, progress is up, assistance holding down. You got two instruments to, to work at this and rotate around. So that was kind of the squeeze gave me a little bit, a little more work to do. You can do small, median lobes, and, and what happens is you end up doing them from the side and then climbing the node, uh, climbing the median lobe, and then pushing it down. I, would, I haven't done anything too aggressive about that, but, you know, small little bulges. The, the key, in fact, what, I, what, I, what I'm deciding, there's the squeeze technique. The, the important thing, I don't have it on the, on the screen or anything, but uh, is, is you take your prostate MRI and you look at the sagittal view. And then you just track the seminal vesicle view through the bladder neck. And if you've got a relatively straightforward line or one that you think you can straighten out, then you can attempt back here. And if it's all chaotic looking, prior terp and all that, then probably just stay anterior. Again, one nice thing about this approach is that there's nothing about this that's committal. There's nothing that says you couldn't work back here, and then if you don't like what you see, switch to your normal anterior approach. Obviously, if you if you set up a single port, and extra peritoneal, you've sort of committed to that um, space. So now we're kind of inside the funnel, uh, getting the rest of the bladder neck spare down. And there it is from, from behind. So really the Maryland up high, I mean, the trigone is way up here. You're always worried about the trigone until some people explain to you where it is and you kind of think it through. But trigone's way up here. You're not going to see it. As long as you do a nice uh, funneled uh, reconstruction here, you'll be fine. If you're worried, actually you've done it a couple of times, do an anastomosis uh, and then put a scope in and look at it yourself while the patient's on the table and convince yourself that the trigones is a separate um, area there. So now we're working, you know, over the prostate. So even though we're working upside down, you know, so to speak, we're now working uh, back anteriorly, uh, if you will, top side down. And it's just a matter of getting the gland off. I don't really, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I, I want to be sure my anterior margins are good. So I'm mostly under the dorsal vein, but I don't really worry about it. If you're in the dorsal vein or in some of the channels, uh, it'll ooze like that. But then you can just put a few small vicrals on there at the end and get rid of that. You can see we're in the cavity there to the right. I'm, I, I'm sure you could do a super fine anterior margin and stay strictly under the DVC, but then you've got literally no, if you got transition zone tumor, you've got no margin back there. So uh, and for that said, for selection criteria, if the patients do have kind of extensive anterior tumor or anything like that, I generally don't do this technique. On the other hand, I've d definitely done high risk cases that just have very, very straightforward posterior lateral typical uh, lesions, because uh, you can control all those from those early steps, just like you would do anterior. There's really no difference in, in the moves there. We're turning the corner and getting you know, somewhere between the dorsal vein and the urethra. Uh, so based on your timeline, I didn't include uh, anastomosis, but uh, there's really good um, videos from Kunra and uh, Aldo Bacciardi that are, uh, they're basically live demonstrations from the challenges in laparoscopy and robotics course. 
Um, I think they're both from 2017. They've got a moderated panel and everything. Um, so Ra's got a really good way of explaining uh, how to do the anastomosis. Essentially, you're just mirror imaging. You're anchoring stitches or anterior, and you're finishing uh, posterior. I still use a 3.0 um, uh, Stratifix. Um, so Rick, and you said you wanted to read some comments or uh, do some Q and A because th this is going to run out here shortly. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we've got about a minute left. Uh, one more time, kind of breaking up. Have you seen any differences in content of them? Oh yeah. I think they're very comparable. In fact, we we done some math and we we're considering the concept of of I guess you would, what I would call it is a um, a uh, hypothesis generating randomized trial. So we're we're as soon as we you know we got shut down by COVID like everyone, but. As soon as they kind of open up our research offices and everything better, um, we're going to go through a randomization scheme, try to do about 30 each of single port. I mean, single port does take down um, some of the Retzia space, but you are preserving the complete urachis and lateral attachments. Uh, I do leave an overnight drain in those extra peritoneals just to get that suction down. Um, the So the, the interesting finding would be is if the... Uh, the single port were close enough to the Retzia sparing. Uh, I think a lot of people might like the single port, uh, being that it's um, a more familiar anterior approach. Um, but there's nothing that can't be learned either way. Uh, but but Retzia, uh, I'm very impressed with it so far. So we'll try to do more of a structured trial with Epic um, folks. And we still have enough indications to do anterior approach um, and, you know, with an XI and just so, so really, I, I was thinking of a three arm approach to try to answer that a little bit better. Another question that came on is if you have uh, if you go home on the same day, let's see a sparing approach. At, well, we are transparent, Neil. I've not sent them home the same day. I, uh, it's kind of on my bucket list to work on. Um, we have gotten a, a handful of the single ports out the uh, the same day, especially if they're a morning case. So in theory, uh, in about an hour, uh, the morning case from the day, we'll check on and see if he can go. I think with COVID-19, I think people are uh, happy to get out sooner than later. <laughs> yeah, I think they don't want to stay in the hospital. Dr. Joseph is asking, um, what's your experience with a very large median lobe with respect to controlling the size of the bladder net? using Retzia sparing? Um, typically, if you've really, a, a small bulging like thing, you, you really, again, you look at your sagittal approach, approach it laterally if you do it, and I've gotten by with it a few times, um, but um, sometimes it's just too much and then you, you just stop and finish anteriorly. Um, so I think there's plenty of opportunity to kind of practice with without pushing the limits there too much. Dr. Meehan's asking if the, uh, what anatomical structures are preserved during retzia sparing, any nerves or muscles that are sacrificed during the anterior approach that are preserved in the retzia sparing approach? No, I, I think of it, and uh, Keith Kowalski in, in the Washington area had, had gave us a nice lecture, kind of like I'm doing for you, and um, he actually went and looked up some of the history of there was a Dr. Retzius or whatever. <laughs> Um, from, you know, someone who's painted more than photographed uh, that long ago. Um, I, I think there's something about the way the Retzia space helps the bladder um, expand and contract. If you kind of, again, look at the anatomy from a sagittal MRI uh, and imagine what we do surgically, uh, when we drop the space of Retzia, the bladder falls down and then it fills from posterior to anterior. And for the most part, we're either upright or laying down. So my my thinking is that it's having to fill and it's got, has more pressure because it's fighting its own weight. If you look at how the bladder is naturally suspended, if it stays there anteriorly, then the bladder fills anterior to posterior in sort of a weightless um, method. So you know the it's it's expanding downwards. Um, other than that, I don't know why. I, obviously, in the modern era, you're combining retzia sparing or single port. 
with much better understanding of apical anatomy and urethral lengthening like you saw in several videos. I only bring that up because I don't know why the, the perineal prostate surgeons from the 90s didn't figure this out. My only guess is that they didn't know how to lengthen the urethra as well as we do now. Because um, you have to do, you have to have a good long urethra as a anchor for good continence, and then all these other tricks I think add to the picture. Awesome, Dr. Davis. There haven't been any more questions that popped up. Well, I'll ask a question I was going to type, but you're too fast. Uh, oh, you got your. In terms of, uh, you know, uh, dead now, you show three different techniques. Um, at at what point uh, the techniques that you have to learn become too many? You know, how many of each? Uh, how many ways you want to slice the pie to remain proficient and 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 competent? You know, I mean, how, what's the recommendation? It's, it's a those? it's a valid question. I mean, I have a you know I have a denominator of two forty two fifty a year. So I um, all the you know this is basically all I'm doing. So that's that's my point of view. But you know the fellow I'm working with this month is uh, going to re-enter the military uh, in San Antonio, and he'll have a denominator of 50, 60 cases a year, and so and trainees. So uh, I think that's going to be just individualized uh, based on how uh, the size of your practice and um, you know the extent of trainees. So for him, but that being said, uh, I've gotten him through all most all of the Retsia sparing steps. I think he'll give it a shot. I did have another question pop in. If you don't do a retzia sparing approach, would you recommend suspending the bladder as an adjunct? Well, I if I go anteriorly, I usually do that bone anchoring for the um, for the dorsal vein. So yes, but that's really the DVC suspension. I don't really do much else to the um, bladder. But that being said, for a long time, uh, because of this I interest, uh, if I'm doing a standard anterior approach, I usually leave the uracus up. Uh, and work around the sides of it. Um, so that in theory would help it um, heal quicker. We have, uh, as a, you know, as an example, we had a recent case, you know, I, I uh, the lymph node data that I've published in the British Journal of Urology, you know, pretty much show that uh, there's not a lot of therapeutic value and there's not a lot of diagnostic either when you're down in the Gleason three plus four range, but it's never zero. So we had a recent case of a 75 year old um, who had just three plus four and was very fit, thin and wanted surgery. So we just did a RETS sparing and no nodes, but he was upgraded to four plus three and had immediately detectable um, PSA, which when we then PET scanned him, we could actually see it left external iliac. You couldn't see it pre-op. Um, so we took him back about, and it adds up to about six weeks, I think, or so. And we put the ports in, there's no scarring, and it, literally it looks like we were never there. I mean, the bladder is in the exact same position, the pouch is healed. So we just broke off on the side and did extended nodes, took about 45 minutes. There were two positive on the left, and then we're waiting on this PSA follow-up at this point. Um, on the other hand, I, when I've done salvage behind other surgeons who drop everything, it does heal, but it heals forward about several centimeters. Uh, so the arachis is all downhill, so it looks a little bit different. So I think it's probably useful to spare as much as you can anteriorly, even if you're coming from the anterior approach. Awesome, thanks so much for the videos and the you know informative uh, hints and tips there. We all appreciate it. All right. I think that's all the questions we have for today. So thanks so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for having me. Great. Hey, thanks, John. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Nice. Very nicely done. Thanks.